Sabbath greetings to you all my brothers and sisters out there. We hope that you had a wonderful week with so many blessings and so much reflection about the lesson that we are looking at last Sabbath, lesson number 16. We looked at the characteristics of a false and a true prophet. And I think by this time around you should not be deceived by anyone because Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 24 is cautioning that take heed that no man deceive you so we would love to also take you backwards a bit into lesson number 15 where we looked at how Jeremiah met Hananiah and that this Hananiah was a false prophet yet he was claiming that all his sayings and teachings and prophecies were coming from God but at the end of the day we learned that he died because he presumptuously spoke not after God's own instruction, but after his own imagination. And in lesson number 14, we learned that Jeremiah was a fearless man. He was a prophet of God, whom God had appointed when the children of Israel were taken into uh, captivity for 70 years in Babylon. And that people hated him because he was rebuking evils, the wrongs that were taking place as the children of Israel were in captivity. So I'm hoping that you're going to enjoy today's lesson number 17 as we look at conspiracy and the temple foundation. Conspiracy and the temple foundation. So in this lesson, we have the key text which is coming from Prophets and Kings, page 594 and 595. And it says, throughout the history of God's people, Great mountains of difficulty, apparently insurmountable, have loomed up before those who are trying to carry out the purposes of heaven. Such obstacles are permitted by the Lord as a taste of faith. When we are hedged about on every side, this is the time, above all others, to trust in God in the power of his spirit. The exercise of a living faith means an increase of spiritual strength and the development of an unfaltering trust. It is thus that the soul becomes a conquering power. Before the demand of faith, the obstacles placed by Satan across the pathway of the Christian will disappear for the power of heaven will come to his aid nothing shall be impossible unto you Matthew chapter 17 verse 20 quoted so from this quotation my brothers and sisters we are able to see the foundation being laid concerning the topic that we'll be looking at today and the key lessons that are coming out are that in all ages, those who strive to push for the work of God to move have always experienced difficulties. So you are not the first one, my brother or sister out there, if you are experiencing some difficulties and obstacles when you are pushing for the work of God, you are not the first one. Because there are others who have lived the same life experience. And these lessons are going to be revealed to us so that we don't get discouraged when obstacles come our way. And that God permits these obstacles to test our faith. And that when such come, it is a time for us to put all our trust in God. And to allow the power of heaven to manifest uh, its powers. And we learn that with God, nothing shall be impossible with us. So whatever we plan shall be blessed. Whatever we say, it shall come to pass because it has an inspiration of God. So don't get discouraged, my brother and sister, as you are pursuing the work of God, as you are trying your best to win some souls to the side of Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible tells us that he that wins souls for Christ is wise. So you want to be wise? Work hard. Put in the best and win a soul, two souls, three souls for Jesus Christ. Don't despair in all your plans because God is going to test your faith. And when you 
persevere prayerfully, God is going to be with you. So in this lesson, I pray that the Lord may guide you and give you the Holy Spirit so that you have a clear understanding of how you can learn from the lessons of our forefathers. Let us go to question number one under the subheading, the decree to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. The decree to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Question one, by divine providence and in fulfillment of prophecy, what decree did Cyrus the Great make in the first year of his reign? Ezra chapter 1 verse 1 to 4 says, Now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? Is God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and view the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold, and with goods and with beasts beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. These are the ways which are coming from Israel chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. Conditions were now changed. In tender mercy, the Lord had again visited his people and allowed them to return to their own land. Sadness because of the mistakes of the past should have given way to feelings of great joy. God had moved upon the heart of Cyrus to aid them in rebuilding the temple. And this should have called forth expression of a profound gratitude. But some failed of discerning God's opening providences. Instead of rejoicing, they cherished thoughts of discontent and discouragement. They had seen the glory of Solomon's temple, and they lamented because of the inferiority of the building of now to be erected. So we can see this from this context. The children of Israel were taken into captivity for 70 years, and the time had come for them now to be uh, relieved and to be taken back to Jerusalem. So God, through his own providence, worked through uh, Cyrus, the king, and he spoke to him to say, there must be a temple of God to be rebuilt back in Jerusalem. So let's get back to the question and be able to answer the, the, the question. By divine providence and in the fulfillment of prophecy, what decree did Cyrus the Great make in the first year of his reign. So here we are told that uh, he proclaimed throughout his kingdom, both in writing and in spoken words, saying that, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. That's, that's what uh, Cyrus actually proclaimed. So the Lord revealed to him that the house of God must be built at uh, Jerusalem and he called whoever would be available let him go and let him be helped by the people he's going to meet so that the temple of God might be built and we have learned that actually this temple of God was to be built using the gifts of gold and silver and beasts and free will offerings which should be the case also in the time that we are living in whatever we are called upon to do we need to bring all sorts of offerings that can help 
in building the temple of God. And here we have seen that as this plan was being initiated, there were still some people who were discouraged and discontent, especially they were comparing what was to be done with the temple that was built by Solomon. But God works through each individual based on their talents. We will not be able to compare this to the other one. He will look at you and me and see what talents you have and you work based on what you're capable of doing. So God is calling upon us to build him a house. But even going beyond the material building, God is calling upon us to offer ourselves so that he can construct a spiritual temple within our souls for him to dwell with us. Yeah, so we continue with question number two. Who joined together to return to Jerusalem and build the Lord's house? Who joined together to return to Jerusalem and build the Lord's house? In response to the king's decree, what did their neighbors give them? Israel chapter 1, verse 5 to 7, we continue with the story. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, and with beasts, and with precious things, beside all that was willingly offered. Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem, and had put them in the house of his gods. The chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised, these were the goodly remnant, about 50,000 strong from among the Jews in the lands of the exile. All determined to take advantage of the wonderful opportunity offered them to go up to view the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Their friends did not permit them to go empty-handed. All they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, and with goods, and with beasts, and with precious things. And to these and many other voluntary offerings were added the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem. Even those did Cyrus, king of Persia, bring forth by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, 5,400 5, in number for use in the temple that was to be rebuilt. Israel chapter 1, verse 5 to 11, quoted in the Spirit of Prophets, Prophets and Kings, page 559. So if we go back, we have to answer the question. Who joined together to return to Jerusalem and build the Lord's house? So here we have been told that the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, with all of them whose spirit had been uh, raised by God, are the ones who moved. And that these were about uh, 50,000 in number. And that they were goodly men. They were people with good talent, fine thinking, strategic way of doing things. These are the ones who were teamed up. And they are to go and start building the temple of God. And in response to the king's decree, what did their neighbors give them? And they were given various gifts in form of silver, gold, beasts, vessels. And even the king himself, he had to retain the vessels which were once taken away from the temple which was once built by Solomon. You remember I told you to say, uh, Nebuchadnezzar once came to, to Jerusalem and he painted the temple and took away the vessels which were in the temple. But this time around, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, Cyrus had to retain back the vessels and they were given to uh, the people who were going back to Judah. And that there was a mix of different types of vessels, about 5,400. So we can see here God's providence. 
in the way that was least expected, many gifts were given to these stout men, these brave men who took upon themselves to go and build the house of the Lord. So even today, God is calling upon us to participate and to be part, part and parcel of a good cause to build the temple of God. But don't forget the application from the spiritual context. Let us open our hearts for the Lord to build his temple in our lives today. So we'll be proceeding to question number three. Thorough planning despite opposition. So here we are told that there was opposition that was going on. Others didn't want this temple to be rebuilt. But these 50,000 men, brave enough, were able to do thorough planning in spite of this opposition. Question three. What was necessary before the work could proceed? In what year did the construction of the Lord's house begin? Who were present when the foundation was laid? Let's read. Israel chapter 3 verse 6, last part and verse 10. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. They gave money also unto the Muslims and to the carpenters, and meat, and drink, and oil unto them of Zidon, and to them of Tyre, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea of Joppa, according to the grant that they had of Cyrus king of Persia. Now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shutel and Jeshua, the son of Josedak, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from twenty years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren. Kedmel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God. The sons of Enadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. The workmen engaged in the preparation of the building material found among the ruins some of the immense stones brought to the temple site in the days of Solomon. These were made ready for use and much new material was provided. And soon the work was advanced to the point where the foundation stone must be laid. This was done in the presence of many thousands who had assembled to witness the progress of the work and to give expression to their joy in having a part in it. While the cornerstone was being set in position, the people, accompanied by the trumpets of the priests and the symbols of the sons of Asaph, sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. Prophets and Kings, page 563. So let's go back to the question, and then we'll be able to comment. What was necessary before the work could proceed. So planning was key before the, uh, the advancement of the work. Planning, dedication was key. In what year did the construction of the Lord's house uh, begin? So we have seen that uh, this work started in the second year of their coming into the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month. Who were present when the foundation was late. So here we have been told that the priests were there and there were, there were other thousands of people were in attendance and that there were also musicians to uh, actually bless this important event with music and cymbals and trumpets. They were singing praises because 
is good and his mercy endure forever. Indeed, the mercy of God endure forever because these people were in captivity for 70 years. They had almost forgotten about their, 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 their homelands and the, the temple which they, they worshipped God. But the time had come for this temple to be reconstructed. So they were joyous and the work was being dedicated by the high priests and that there was uh, a very good accompaniment of, of music during this time when they were during this uh, they were laying the foundation or the cornerstone of the temple. This same principle can apply today when you are building the house of the Lord, let there be praises, let there be uh, ministers, Levites to bless the work and to sing praises to the Lord because whatever happens, whatever success that we may record is because of the mercy of God, is because of God's providence. May God help us if we have not built to actually engage in building, asking the priests, bringing people together to sing praises. And when it succeeds, the praises must ascend to heaven, not to end. Going forward, let's go to question number four. What did the representatives of the local population whom the Assyrians had relocated to this territory decades before ask for? What did the representatives of the local population whom the Assyrians had relocated to this territory decades before ask for? Israel chapter 4 verse 1 to 2. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel. Then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as he do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the day of Asahadon, king of Asa, which brought us up either. When the temple at Jerusalem was rebuilt in the days of Israel, the Samaritans wished to join the Jews in its construction. This privilege was refused to them, and a bitter animosity sprang up between the two peoples. The Samaritans built a rival temple on Mount Gerizim. Here they worshipped in accordance with the Mosaic ritual, though they did not wholly renounce idolatry. But disasters attended them. Their temple was destroyed by their enemies, and they seemed to be under a curse. Yet they still clung to their traditions and their forms of worship. They would not acknowledge the temple at Jerusalem as the house of God, nor admit that the religion of the Jews was superior to their own. It's all ages page 188. I think you are familiar with the relationship that existed between the Samaritans and the Jews. These two believed that they should not in any way meet together. In fact, this is the story of a good Samaritan woman. We should be able to, uh, to relate how Jesus Christ brought down all the boundaries and barriers which were initially there by that account that we often read about of a Samaritan woman at at the well. So let's go back to the uh, question. I was just reminding you about something and to know the historical context of why these two groups uh, were always at a distance in terms of their system of worship. What did the representatives of the local population whom the Assyrians had relocated to this territory decades before asked for? They asked that they should build with the Jews together with them, but this was denied and when it was denied they decided to go and build a rival temple somewhere else you see that but this did not in any way help them in fact many calamities and curses followed them because that was not after the order of God it was after their own order and they failed to acknowledge that the religion and the faith of the Jews was superior to theirs because these were mixing truth and error they would try to uh, follow suit in the laws of God and the mosaic ceremonies and at the same time cling unto idolatry. And this spirit, God doesn't want. He doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He wants us to decide whether for good or either for idolatry or for his commandments. So God wouldn't accept that mix of idolatry and uh, what is written in the word of God. So even today, we should be very careful not to mix 
not to be lukewarm, but to decide whether for good or for evil. And then God will know what to do to us. Let us remember this all the time. And let us do the work according to God's own instruction, not according to our own imagination or according to our own calling. God is the one who calls people to build his temple and not to the honor and glory of any individual, but to the honor and glory of his name. Question five. What answer did Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and other leaders of the people give to this request? Why? So partly we have answered to say there was no access for them. They, they were not given a leeway to build together with the Jews. And let's find out what further response was given and why. Israel chapter 4 verse 3 says, But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto God our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. They told them, it was, it was not their business to, to, to be part and parcel of this project. Zerubbabel and his associates were familiar with these and men like scriptures, and in the recent captivity, they had evidence after evidence of their fulfillment. And now, having repented of evils that had brought upon them and their fathers the judgment foretold so plainly through Moses, having turned with all the heart to God and renewed their covenant relationship with him, they had been permitted to return to Judea, that they might restore that which had been destroyed. Should they, at the very beginning of their undertaking, enter into covenant with idolaters? Thou shalt make no covenant with them. God said this to them. And those who had recently rededicated themselves to the Lord at the altar, set up before the ruins of his temple, realized that the line of demarcation between his people and the world is ever to be kept unmistakably distinct. They refused to enter into alliance with those who, though familiar with the requirements of God's law, would not yield to its claims. Prophets and Kings, page 569 and 570. So here we have been given a very clear um, guideline, even in our time. What answer did Zerubbabel, Yeshua, and the other leaders of the people give to this request when the, the Samaritans came to say, can we build together? They were given this response. They said unto them, you have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. Nothing at all. But we ourselves together with will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus commanded. That's the response that they gave them. And I think this is a lesson for us today. There are people who may come into our lives to pretend as though they want to help us. And yet, they are after evil intentions to make us fail. So we need to have spiritual discernment. We need to have a prayer of mind to be able to discern that this is deception. So let us learn the lessons and learn the wisdom which was in Zerubbabel, Yeshua, and others, such that if an enemy sends people who pretend to be in support, yet they are planning to do evil, we should be able to discern and say, this has nothing to do with you, but we will do it ourselves. And God will work through few just as much as he can work through many. Let's go to question number six under the subheading and relenting attacks and their effects. We are from looking at question five where Joshua, Zerubbabel and others refused to work with the Samaritans who were coming to pretend to offer good service and yet their motives were wrong. They were not after helping but to distract. And these are things which can happen today. So, and relenting attacks and their effects. So, when they were rejected to offer their services, what did they do? They went into attacking. Their true motives and characters were revealed. Now, let's, let us see what are the effects of these unrelenting attacks, which you and I can actually experience today. Question six. 
how did the people of the country react? How far did they go in their resistance to God's purpose? You look at these people. They came with a good face, smiling, to say, we want to give help also. We want to build with you the house of the Lord. But when they were rejected, they started something else. So let us learn something. How did the people of the country react? How far did they go in their resistance to God's purpose? Israel chapter 4, verse 4 to 7 say, Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. All the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia, and in the reign of Hazarus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. And in the days of Ataxes, wrote Bishlam, Mithredath, Tabel, and the rest of their companions unto Ataxes, king of Persia, and the writing of the letter was written in the Syrian tongue and interpreted in the Syrian tongue. In rebuilding the house of the Lord, Zerubbabel had labored in the face of manifold difficulties. From the beginning, adversaries had weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and made them to seize by force and power. Israel chapter 4 verse 4 and 23. But the Lord had interposed in behalf of the builders. And now he spoke through his prophet to Zerubbabel, saying, Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 7. And we are reading from Prophets and Kings page 594. How did the people of the country react? So actually when they could no longer be allowed or they could not be allowed to participate in the building of the house of the Lord, they tried by all means to weaken and frustrate the efforts which these uh, children of Israel were putting in to build the house of the Lord. How far did they go in their resistance to God's purpose? They went as far as writing to the king to say, the children of Israel here are causing havoc and to try to misrepresent and paint wrongly about what they were doing. These things, my brothers and sisters, are happening right today in the times that we are living in. You are committed to the work of God. You may be a sister out there. You may be a brother. And people want to paint a false picture about you. They want to misrepresent you. But don't forget what we learned in lesson number 14. That even Jesus Christ himself was misrepresented. Evil reports were, were spread all over and they were spreading like fire very fast. Yet Jesus Christ never went to react to such. He continued to focus on what was right. Even you and I today, we need to focus on what is right. We should not be distracted by evil reports that are labeled against you or against me or any other person who is dedicated uh, to try to do the work of God. But we should focus on what matters. Things that can bring progress in the house of the Lord. Today, there is so much fighting. There is so much uh, trouble within each and every individual that is living. That fight must not be distracted. Because if you continue, don't uh, lose out the focus. One day or the other, you are going to emerge victorious. And you are going to conquer the evil forces that are always at war with you. It could be spiritually or through human beings. God is going to make you emerge above such circumstances. And you are going to win and you are going to meet and live your dreams. We go into the last question of today's lesson. Because of their evil insinuations and influence on King Ataxus, what did he order? Contrary to the will and decree of Cyrus, what was stopped in Jerusalem and remained suspended for years? Israel chapter 4, verse 8 
and 21 to 24. Raham, the chancellor, and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxas the king. Give ye now commandments to cause these men to cease, and that this city be not builded, until another commandment shall be given from me. Take heed now that ye fail not to do this. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the kings? Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes later was read before Raham and Shimshai, the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem and to the Jews and made them to seize by force and power. Then seize the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. This is really very sad. Very, very sad and disappointing. And I think it has been revealed so that you and I can gain the courage that these things have happened before. You might be doing a very good job somewhere, trying to do your best for the cause of God. But someone can conspire and report evil against you. And you may actually be stopped from doing what is right. Don't get discouraged. This is something that happened also to those men, stout men, men of talent and strategic thinking. They were blocked by evil men and they managed. Yes, an evil man can prevail for a particular period of time, but they cannot prevail for too long. Let us read something from the Spirit of Prophecy. The opposition of their enemies was strong and determined, and gradually the builders lost heart. Some could not forget the scene at the lying of the cornerstone, when many had given expression to their lack of confidence in the enterprise. And as the Samaritans grew more bold, many of the Jews questioned whether, after all, the time had come to rebuild. The feeling soon became widespread. Many of the workmen, discouraged and disheartened, returned to their homes to take up the ordinary peasants of life. During the reign of Symbiosis, the work of the temple progressed slowly, and during the reign of the false Smedes, called Artaxas in Israel, chapter 4, verse 7, the Samaritans induced the unscrupulous imposter to eat issue a decree forbidding the Jews to rebuild their temple and city. Prophets and Kings, page 572 and 573. So we have seen, my brothers, it's a very sad development. These people are determined. They were given so many gifts as we have read. They were willing to build the house of the Lord as soon as time would allow, but they were obstructed. They became discouraged and they went back to do their ordinary day-to-day uh, -day lifestyle. But today, these things may happen to you and me. It may happen to anyone who is trying to push the work of God. We should not get discouraged. Yes, there will be a short moment of discouragement, but we should keep that flame of confidence and hope in the Lord that at this another point in time, He is going to cause His work to be resuscitated and for work to move forward. So, many things might have been blessed, dedicated but you find that it fails to take place why because god maybe has not permitted that should happen at such a time we should not lose hearts but wait patiently upon the time of the lord from the the story of this conspiracy which was made against these determined men of of israel to build the house of the lord there are many lessons that we can learn there are many people can conspire against you my brother and sister to prevent you from doing not just spiritual work but even Material work, it could be your academics, it could be your farm work, it could be just your the way you carry yourself. Other people may not be happy, they may conspire against you to try to block you. Don't lose the focus on God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. It may take longer and longer and longer than expected, but the time will come when it shall be well again. So as we wind up, my brothers and sisters, we have ways of encouragement for further reflection. Such were the conditions existing during the early part of the reign of Darius, his Tespes. 
spiritually as well as temporarily, the Israelites were in a peaceable state. So long had they murmured and doubted, so long had they chosen to make personal interests first, well doing with apathy the Lord's temple in ruin, that many had lost sight of God's purpose in restoring them to Judea. And these were saying, the time is not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built, Haggai chapter 1 verse 2. And actually when you read further, you find that in this same uh, chapter, you find the pronouncement of curses upon those who thought it's not the right time to actually even build the house of the Lord. There are many other things that we can we can focus on. They were building beautiful houses. And if it were in our time, we'd, building, we'd be building more ambitious houses. Buy the best cars and buy the best phones and laptops and so on and so forth. Well, lest we leave the house of the Lord desolate. And there are curses that will follow us if we follow the path of the children of Israel during this time. It goes on to say, just as long as we are in this world and the Spirit of God is striving with the world, we are to receive as well as to impart favors. We are to give to the world the light of truth as presented in the sacred scriptures. And we are to receive from the world that which God moves upon them to do in behalf of his cause. The Lord still moves upon the house of kings and rulers in behalf of his people. And it becomes those who are so deeply interested in the religious liberty question not to cut off any favor or withdraw themselves from the help that God has moved men to give for the advancement of his cause. We find examples in the word of God concerning this very matter. Cyrus, king of Persia, made a proclamation throughout his kingdom and put it into writing. A second commandment was issued by Darius for the building of the house of the Lord and is recorded in the sixth chapter of Israel. So we have seen that God is calling upon us. And these things that happen in the history of Israel are still happening today. That we need not to murmur before him, not to put our personal interests first and God's last. No. But we need to put God first and then all these other things shall sort themselves out according to Matthew chapter 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then the rest will add and they will, they will happen almost automatically and effortlessly because God would have put his blessings. Let us not be like, ch like children of Israel who in their imaginations thought it was not the right time to build the house of the Lord. Yet, they were busy building their own houses, living in beautiful homes, yet the house of the Lord was left desolate. And we have also been warned to say we need to take advantage of opportunities in this life. Sometimes the people whom we may not actually have anything uh, in common as, as far as spirituality is concerned may make certain rules and laws that can be to our advantage. That can be an opportunity. We need to actually grab these opportunities and use them to serve and glorify the name of God. So I'm hoping and we pray that the Holy Spirit may help you to have a more detailed understanding of how God works. That even if there are many obstacles along the way as a Christian, even as just any other human being, whatever you do, don't lose the focus when things seem to be crumbling down. God may allow a delay. God may even allow a failure so that you learn to trust in him. But at his appointed time, is going actually to make it happen because with him there's nothing impossible as long as we trust in his name he will do miracles that we least expect because with god there is nothing impossible so my brother and sister out there may you be blessed and reflect so much upon this lesson we pray that the holy spirit may amplify more where we perhaps failed to explain more eloquently. May God bless you and enjoy the Sabbath and the rest of the coming week. Amen.